Why wait to earn the degree you deserve? You have the experience. You have the knowledge. Now is the time to get the credit for the work you've done and earn the recognition you deserve by starting your comeback at Purdue Global. It's time to earn a degree you'll be proud of. A degree that employers will respect. It's never too late. Never too late to come back stronger and move forward in your career. Start your comeback today at purdueglobal.edu. Purdue's online university for working adults. Simple Truth Brand makes it easy to find better for you products that are free from unwanted ingredients. From fresh produce and snacks to household cleaners and more. You won't find artificial ingredients, preservatives, or harsh chemicals in Simple Truth products. So you can fill your fridge and your home with simple, easy-to-understand choices you can feel good about. Just look for the green Simple Truth Circle to get the quality items you want free from the ingredients you don't want. Simple Truth, exclusively at Baker's. Episode 353, Managing Money with Chronic Illness with Dr. Andrea Feigl. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, money, embrace simplicity, and live a richer life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. Welcome to Frugal Friends Podcast. My name is Jen. My name is Jill. And today we are talking with Dr. Andrea Feigl, who is an expert in chronic illness and the economic burden and kind of closing the gap between that and accessing care for all of our listeners with chronic illnesses and all of our listeners who love someone or care about someone with a chronic illness. And this was just a great, great interview. I'm so excited to share it with you. Really, really beautiful. Please do stay with us because just heartfelt. You can sense it from Dr. Feigl just the entire time of her understanding of chronic illness, all of the different layers and nuances associated, the the micro level, the macro level. So we're going to we're going to hear it all and as we discovered through the episode, chances are every single one of us does have somebody, a friend, a family member or ourselves managing a chronic illness. So yeah, this episode really is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar with like the term chronic illness, what we're talking about when we say that is stuff like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, obesity, arthritis. This is, that's what, how the CDC gives examples of it. There's also ALS, Alzheimer's, arthritis, asthma, stuff that is ongoing and it is chronic in nature, not acute. So that could be anything, whether it's from childhood or developed over time. We're going to cover, we're not talking about any specific illness. We're talking about it in a broader form. Anybody with any of these will hopefully get something out of today's episode. But before we get into this episode, this one is brought to you by Forgetting. I pressed play on this episode without writing anything in this section because I forgot to. And once I realized it, it was too late. We were already recording. and I was wondering. You're good at winging it. And here we are. I am winging it. But you don't have to wing it if you subscribe to The Friend Letter every week, three times a week, for free. You are going to get small actionable tips to save money without winging it. You are never going to forget a free day that might have free food or activities. You're never going to forget how to get all clad quality stainless steel cookware at a fraction of the price because we're teaching you what you need to look for to get the right dupes. And you're never going to forget how to become a better values-based spender because we're helping you with those things every week. Frugalfriendspodcast.com, the pop-up will be there. Or if you want to go straight there, frugalfriendspodcast.com slash friend letter. Mic drop. You do your best work on the spot. Look at you. I do Just look work at you on the spot. For those of that you who can't look at sure. her, listen to her. <laughs> Because it's a podcast. Yes. <laughs> but you can look at her on Instagram, actually. Go follow us. Yes, at Frugal Friends Podcast. Uh, if this is a topic that is of interest to you for any reason, we have 
another episode that is pretty in line with this one, negotiating medical bills with Dr. Virgie Bright Ellington. She is a doctor who now specializes in patient advocacy for, we talk a little bit about negotiating medical debt, but it's it's really about negotiating medical bills. That's episode 230. And we will mention it later in the episode, but episode 336, how to get health and self-care services for free or low cost. That will be a good one to listen to after this one, because we mention it at a certain point. Let's do it. Dr. Feigl, welcome to Frugal Friends. We're so excited to have you here to talk about this topic. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm just as excited as you are. This is a really important conversation, I think, and one that Jen and I know we're not experts in, which is why we love to bring the experts on. So we are so thrilled to have you here and to learn from you. And just as we get started, I'm curious if we can begin here of talking about some of the extra expenses that might be associated with chronic illness. I'm sure that those who are listening who have chronic illness kind of know of this, and so maybe just hearing someone name it for them is going to be helpful. But also for those of us who do not, but we may have friends and family, what can you say about some of the additional costs associated with having chronic illness? Thanks so much, Jill, for this really, really important question. And so for those of you who are tuning in, um, I'm a health economist by training. And one of the, uh, so we focus uh, at our Health Finance Institute, we focus on basically chronic conditions and the impact of and the benefits of prevention, access and adherence. So which then can both save health as well as um, expenses at the patient at the systems level. So When we look at expenses overall at the systems level, if we don't engage early enough in terms of applying the evidence that we have and creating access for those who are faced with a precursor or already the full-blown stages of a chronic condition, we are really losing a lot of direct and indirect costs. Some of my colleagues did a study and it's basically the costs are so high at the societal level in the United States, that it's like 9% of the household budget of the US. So it's kind of like saying whatever revenue the government generates or the the country generates, let's take 9% off of that. And that's what we're dealing with. So if you said to anybody on the street, like, let's just going to give you an extra 9% in taxes, let's just pay tax your income an extra 9%. Everybody would be like, that's crazy. Like, that's insane. Nobody would go along with that. But that's what we're experiencing as a country here in the States. And so what does it mean at the individual level? So from an economic perspective, we look at direct costs and indirect costs. So the direct costs are those paying for your, you know, medical visits, the services, the diagnostics, what we call consumables. So like the lancets, the test strips, for example, for glucose measurements and so on. And then there are also indirect expenses. So we are paying for ill health in two ways. We're not just paying with our pocketbook. We're paying in terms of not being productive at work, having to miss time for doctor's appointments, having additional family members to like, you know, if we're older, helping us managing appointments, navigating the care system, and the list goes on basically as well. Early retirement, for example. So when we look at what the costs are, as economists, we look at both. Back to your question, based on the, you know, often based on the job you have and based on the economic status that allows you to basically buy different levels of insurance, right? And based on the insurance that you do have, certain things are or aren't covered. So you can really be faced with a lot of both direct costs, then the cost of navigating the system, and then the indirect cost of not being able to be the most productive version of yourself when you're faced with a chronic condition. Yeah, I often forget that it's not just indirect costs for a person with chronic illness, but also for the person taking care of them. They also have to sometimes miss work going to procedures and stuff like that. So even if you had a partner taking care of you that has income, the household income can't be as high. And that's something I didn't know until I talked to more people with chronic illness. 
Yeah, and it's both for persons with chronic illnesses, the caretaking, but also as as people are aging. And most often that actually also that burden can fall on women, the daughters and the sisters and their moms. And that actually can also lead to women dropping out of the workforce. For example, we saw that during the pandemic that predominantly moms were taking care of the children or sick family members and the labor force participation rate dropped to like a level not seen for decades because again of the toll of caretaking. And I don't have the exact numbers, but sometimes we see really like 20 to 30 percent depression in income because of these caretaking activities and also like the health toll as well, like the mental illness Uh, not mental illness, but the mental burden that comes along, the mental health burden that comes with these caretaking activities and the burnout. And and it's something, again, that's kind of like a silent partner of the chronic disease burden that we see in the United States. And there was a big, actually, front page coverage of the life expectancy is dropping in the United States for yet another year in a row. And the reason is not just inequalities, but really like the chronic disease burden, the massive chronic disease burden and, and social inequalities, and also just a lot of the issues around access to care, the affordability of care, and the accompaniment of that care by either healthcare workers, social workers, or family members, so you can actually adhere. Because again, the cost isn't just, it is, you know, it costs you directly, but it also costs you on other levels, like socially and in terms of your time. Yeah, I so appreciate what you're saying. And I I don't necessarily have a question in what I'm about to say, but I think it's worth underscoring that indirect cost, that what you're labeling and helping us to be able to identify, I think, isn't, hopefully we can kind of come to some version of solutions, but I think in some ways it's just this empathy and freedom and recognition that life is not the same for someone managing chronic illness or the caretakers or the partners or the family and the friends of those who are managing chronic illness because we can't expect the same things. I think sometimes we talk in life seasons on this show of Sometimes we go in in and out of seasons where this thing is happening or this overwhelming burden has taken place. But what is being underlined for me and what you're describing is that for someone with chronic illness, it's not just a season, it's a lifetime. And I think so much more so just space and flexibility and managing of expectations when so much of the mainstream conversation about personal finance is going to be hustle and get the better job and do the side business and meal prep for an entire day on a Sunday. And and it's just like none of this is going to be possible for somebody where there's these heavy direct costs, heavy indirect costs. I'm just wanting to underscore the importance of what you've just laid out for us because it's it's hitting me hard mm-hmm. in this, whoa, okay then. With that, then a lot of other things need to shift and we can't expect the same things when, when the circumstances aren't the same. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I appreciate you pointing this out. And just a complete side note, even in the best of days, I've never meal prepped on a Sunday, so... <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> we can not just normalize that across the board. Yeah, not, not we we all don't need to do that. <laughs> so I just want to give everyone who's listening, like, even in the best of times, I don't meal prep. So, but yeah, I mean, I think, and this is then really like a systems response, right? And I think that, I'm sorry if I come back to the systems, I always think about, you know, if this affects me so deeply, like, how can I make sure that we create solutions that if others are in the situations and this goes to the empathy are cho- uh, faced with better options and choices, right? And I think flexible work environments, right, that allow you, like, for example, um, one of our workers, she's managing the care of two people in her family. We've created a work environment where as long as the work gets done, and there's obviously a couple of non-negotiables, right, that can be integrated. And of course, we're not a perfect workplace in whatsoever, but we're trying to basically say, okay, we understand that this amazingly performing individual is also a caretaker of two family members that have chronic conditions. So how can we accommodate that? So we're not just 
going out there saying, well, you know, look at this crazy chronic disease burden. But actually, like for people who are faced with family members whose care they are co-responsible of, that they have the ability. And I don't know, you know, I'm sure there's other workplaces that do even better things. But I think generally that awareness to say it's okay that we are human beings and how can we still achieve our common goals, notwithstanding the fact that we are actually um, in these types of situations or like, you know, some of our family members may be in these types of situations. I think that, you know, if we look at the social network, and this is also like, so when I start my class in health financing um, with my students in Georgetown, I basically say like 80 to 90% of health isn't created in a healthcare system. Mm. So we are a sickness system, right? We, the healthcare system takes care of sick people, right? So mm. what produces a healthy versus a sick individual? And that has a lot to do with the, the socioeconomic status that a person finds themselves in. So by investing in better support structures, and that includes the ability to take that walk over lunch, to have access to that healthy food, to have coverage, to pay for preventative expenses and primary care expenses and check-ins so that you don't just basically start interacting with the healthcare system when you're like completely sick mm. and the costs are just, you know, it's, it's, it's a life or death situation. So we focus a lot on what can we invest now person, at a personal and a societal level so that we then can save in the longer run. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that point. It's a notion of frugality, but applied to not just the individual, but, you know, really, mm -hmm. because, and it's, you know, the funny thing is, if we were frugal about this, right, if we say, okay, let's just spend this money on these um, preventative services, primary care and the check-ins and then all that kind of stuff, we would not just save money, we would actually help the economy grow over time too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this like, why would you invest in this? Well, actually, it's not just good for your pocketbook, it's actually good for your economic growth in many fold mm -hmm. ways. Yes. I love what you're describing about just a workplace, what we can be aiming for in workplaces at a systemic level what types of workplaces we can even be looking for, whether we are managing chronic illness or not, just advocating for or creating. I mean, I know we've got a lot of listeners who are starting their own businesses. And one of the reasons Jen and I have begun Frugal Friends and have sought to grow it is for that flexibility. And I think that conversation can even expand in, into the much larger population just from parenthood perspective. And then people caring for their elderly parents. I mean, pretty much this conversation does hit a lot of people in wanting greater flexibility with their work. And so I think there could be a lot of reasons to look for that or create it in what we're talking about here. Yeah. And what you were saying made me think about like, so in work, yes, that's one place where like you can advocate for yourself as a person with chronic illness are there any other ways that you have seen people or recommend people advocate for themselves to create more flexibility in their schedule or to save that money in the long run or like anything people with chronic illness can do to advocate for themselves either in those direct or indirect expenses? Yeah, I know this is this is such a powerful question. So what we see, like, I think it's understanding what makes you adhere to certain treatment schedules and things like that. And when you look at, for example, 50% of persons who are prescribed a drug like metformin or GLP-1 and whatnot, to, um, which basically regulates your glucose levels, a couple of other mechanisms when, you're when you have primarily type 2 diabetes, which again, a high percentage of Americans are faced with over 50% actually drop off their treatment regimen within two years, right? And the question is, why? And what does this mean, right? It could be financial, right? People could say, well, this is so expensive, I can't afford it, and that needs to be looked into, and we need to find ways to make sure that people can afford it. But there's sometimes also like just factors like, you know, they're too busy, they can't get to the pharmacy on time, they can't do this. But even though it might make sense in the short run, in the long run, what does this mean? It will cost them in terms of health. It will it will exacerbate their conditions. It will cost them in terms of their productivity. So just try not to be penny wise, pound foolish. And also, I think understanding that, you know, what can help you stick 
as an individual, right? It's really chronic conditions. The chronicity term of the term implies it's over time. It's like, you know, it becomes part of your life. It's a lifestyle. And simply as, you know, if, if I know I need to go to bed on time to perform my best, what helps me do that, right? If I know I need to exercise in order not to get anxiety, then what helps me do that? Like, I love group exercise classes. I love workout buddies, right? And what we have seen is that persons with a social social network, and we actually did studies on like social networks of diabetes and weight loss management, they stick much, much more strongly to that regimen. And that actually benefits, you know, the bottom line, both for for the payer, like the insurance, but also for, for persons. So it's it, in a sense, it is frugal to take care of yourself. And I think that is something that we see. We think we save because we don't want to spend on ourselves. But if we actually allow ourselves to keep investing in the day-to-day and what's necessary, again, of course, if we can afford it, it makes so much more sense for our health in the long run. And I think that in terms of like, you know, a person that's faced with having certain prescription drugs and a person has certain workout plans and, and, and advocacy, I think it's finding a understanding how you're ticking, right? Like what makes your healthy choice the easy choice? And maybe we should add what makes the healthy choice the cheap choice so you would choose it. So maybe, you know, we need to think about that. How can we make health, the healthy choice, the easy and the cheap choice? (laughs) <laughs> I love what you're describing. I wish this podcast had video like the whole time because Jill and I are just nodding our heads like, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because we describe frugality as be- being good stewards of all of our resources. And so you're describing our our own physical resources or resources of whatever medications are available to us and beyond and stewarding it well. And there can be a a not stewarding it well by not making use of it, by not taking advantage of it, by not investing some of that money to avoid some of the higher costs it, to both our, our bodies and our wallets if, if we're not doing those things. So I appreciate so much of what you're describing and what people can be considering for advocacy AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash strategic. That's oracle.com slash strategic. Oracle.com slash strategic. Simple Truth Brand makes it easy to find better for you products that are free from unwanted ingredients. From fresh produce and snacks to household cleaners and more. You won't find artificial ingredients, preservatives, or harsh chemicals in Simple Truth products. So you can fill your fridge and your home with simple, easy-to-understand choices you can feel good about. Just look for the green Simple Truth Circle to get the quality items you want free from the ingredients you don't want. Simple Truth, exclusively at Baker's. I'm also curious if what your knowledge is and recommendations are regarding just other financial assistance that people may or may not be aware of, whether government programs or other maybe foundations that people might be able to access to assist and supplement maybe that beyond what they can afford? Yeah. Again, such an important question. It's again, like with 28 million people uninsured in the United States and, you know, personal bankruptcy, the main reason for it still being medical expenses, you know, and we see healthcare as a human right um, in our organization. So, We really absolutely, um, you know, we feel for that, but we also think it's an injustice. But 
What I've come across recently is actually that a lot of pharmaceutical companies have assistance programs for accessing their drugs. And I think that may be something that doesn't, you know, it's not maybe front page news or something like that. But several of the top 10 pharma companies, they actually also assist patients. And that goes beyond, you know, the pharmacy prescription programs and the, and, and the coupons and this and that. You actually can apply to their programs directly if you're showing certain means testing, basically showing you're certain below a certain income threshold or you're uninsured or this or that, because they want to basically show that they are making their programs accessible. I mean, I can't speak for them. I don't know exactly if they're good motives or not. I'm sure they're all across <laughs> the spectrum, right? But I was actually surprised in seeing that there is actually direct consumer assistance for those who are prescribed these um, specific drugs in, in a chronic disease space. And that goes for cancer drugs, who can, which can be very, very expensive. That goes for diabetes-related drugs and others as well. So I encourage listeners to maybe look into that as well. And then I think there's also a notion sometimes that, oh, you know, what does it mean that I have to basically be on, you know, on Medicaid or or things like that? And I think there's no there's no shame in that because I think by taking advantage of these programs and taking care of your own health, that over time can actually pay dividends in terms of you remaining healthy and you staying healthy. And then there are sometimes also like cash assistance programs. So like we have, like I live in a very, I'm very fortunate. I live in a very relatively affluent community, but there are programs, you know, through, you know, the mayor's office and our community centers that it can actually, where people can apply for assistance as well when they have issues with their medical bills. Again, not every community offers these types of programs, but I would just not be afraid to just ask within one social network. And if it's not specific enough, I apologize. We're, we're constantly arguing with governments about how 5% of their GDP can be saved if they just offer better primary care. So sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we don't focus so much on the, you know, on the individual, how the person who should be at the center of this and who is at the center of this can make ends meet and their medical bills stay manageable. No, I mean, that's great information. I have listened to these ads on TV for the drugs and they say, if you can't afford your drug, reach out to the. But I never like thought about it. I never realized like, oh, these drug companies are actually offering assistance. I just assumed they wouldn't. So I like never put two and two together that that's what they were doing because I just assumed they would not. <laughs> yeah, and we found out about it. We were actually we we're working on an index called Health Impact Credit, where we're actually ranking the health impact um, that companies are having. And one of the things is that we're looking at: do they give priority to the worst off, and do they make their uh, medicines affordable and accessible? And then you know we comb through like a lot of data, and we realized that they have these assistance programs. Again, I have never personally applied to one of them, but I was surprised to find that every single major drug company actually offers these programs. And I wonder if they're undersubscribed because both of us here who are in this field are like, actually, this is news to us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Somewhat of a follow-up but peripheral question. And this was not given to you in the outline. So no worries <laughs> if you're like, I, I don't know, that's not me. But you mentioned how the workplace you've created is creating flexibility in the work that you're doing. And for someone who maybe is able and desirous of holding a job while managing chronic illness, are there specific ways that people can look for jobs that are offering this level of flexibility? I mean, I'm not imagining that there's a database, although that would be great. But are you aware of how people can find that type of work? I mean, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, there are sort of like company rankings, right? Like which companies have very good employee wellness programs. There are companies that offer programs through wellness linked insurance. And that's one such program is called Vitality and it started in South Africa. But what they do is basically they incentivize employees to engage in both fitness behavior, in their health checkups, to manage to say blood glucose, hypertension, their weight and so on. And what we found is that even participation of members just by once a month can both save employees over $1,000 in their expenses over a year, plus to get the rewards from a company, but it also saves the insurance company and the employer, therefore, 
a lot in medical expenses. So it's literally like a win-win-win situation. So if I were in the job market, I'm like, I really want to make sure that, you know, my employer is promotes health. I would really look at these types of programs and if they're being offered. I think that there is sometimes a risk, right? If you're going in and you're saying, well, you know, you don't want to come across as somebody who can't manage the regular nine to five. But I think if there is sort of a, if there's an organization that already works, say, in the health space, and <laughs> you know, maybe maybe there is a conversation that can be had. And what was really eye-opening to me was there was like, there's a called Global Week of Action on Chronic Diseases, and it's usually the second week of September each year. And we did like a series, I think it was about two years ago, on chronic illnesses. And we are, you know, we were relatively young and healthy, and we had, I think, 15 employees at that time when we did that. And what was very surprising to me is that Almost everyone had a story of how they're either having their own history with chronic illnesses or an immediate family member. Mm-hmm. And I think it's almost, we just almost have to assume that is the norm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if we can be part of that conversation, saying like, look, like, I mean, it could almost be like a, what chronic disease accommodations do you need? As opposed to like, I think the norm should be like, you know, the same thing when you're like with the pronouns, right? You just want to be like, I was like, you know, at the beginning, I was very ignorant. I said, why do I need to share my pronouns? It's like, well, so that those who have specific preferences that may not be obvious, don't feel the onus is on them, right? It's very share your pronouns. But then like the same thing with this is like, maybe we just assume that everyone is having some sort of help. Like, what are your, you know, what, like, what is it and how can we accommodate it, right? What's the non-negotiable that the employer needs and can this be met? You know, this morning, 8.30 a.m., I was on my way to work. The school nurse called and she ran through it. She didn't even ask if I had time. She just assumed I had time because I'm the mom, right? So <laughs> Jen is laughing. I love it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, it's like, you're the mom. You have to ask yourself questions I when I call it. you because, you know, and I'm like, never mind that I'm running into a meeting mm-hmm. and I'm running a whole, like, and I'm running a company. You're like, no, mom has to be responsible for the health questionnaire of the nurse right now, you know, yeah. which I was able to accommodate. But I'm just saying, like, I guess what I'm trying to say in a very long winded way, if those of us who employ can basically create mm-hmm. a space where we acknowledge that it's more likely than not that everyone has either a chronic condition or someone with a chronic condition that they're partially responsible for. And I would say, what's the plan, right? What's the care plan? And just accommodate for that. And I think that, so again, the one employee that we had, I mean, she, two, three weeks in, she was doing already fantastic work. She, she you know, she was in tears and she was like, I'm going to, I have to lose, uh, you know, I, I think I have to resign because like, I, you know, I have this, this chronic disease uh, in my family and a person with a chronic disease and I, I, you know, I need to manage the care. And we say like, hold on a second. What is it that you're doing? Is there a universe where we can actually come to an agreement? And we were able to come to an agreement, you know, on that basically saying, okay, this is this nest and this and you need to let us know and information is key. And she does fantastic work. Like, I'm so glad she was able to stay with us. And obviously that can't be the outcome in every situation, but I think that openness and I think that has to, I mean, obviously advocacy of chronic disease groups and stuff like it is is key, but I think it also makes a difference from the top, right? (laughs) Where those Mm -hmm. who can make those changes and accommodations can find empathy and say, well, you know, we're working with people, you know, we're not talking, you know, it's not an AI machine that's doing that work. It's actually not a person. And I might be in that person's shoes one day as well. I'm giving you way Mm -hmm. too long reply here. So (laughs) it's, it's beautiful because, and it's, it's opening my eyes even more so to how the workplace is in the States set up in such a way as if our personal life doesn't exist Mm. in the Monday through Friday, nine to five. And again, as you're identifying for pretty much all of us, it's just not true and kind of advocating for there to be space for all of us to be able to work parents, people with chronic illness, caretakers, like, and having greater levels of flexibility, whether we're finding that or creating that if we are in a position of the ability to do that, to create spaces that provide that degree of flexibility and honoring of personhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an important thing to highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So these are things that we can do directly to advocate and for ourselves and our friends and family. Let's look on a, like a macro level. Like how can people with chronic illness and we, the people who love them, how can we advocate for a better future? Like 
what's something I can do without a PhD or a lot of time <laughs> to invest in in like dedicating my life to this? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think just I think generally just being saying that health is a given and health needs to be a given and a rate rather than a benefit. Without health, neither of us would be on this podcast right now, right? So mm-hmm. and again, we see it as something an afterthought sometimes as opposed to something that, that comes at the beginning, right? And in a sense that from a systems perspective, making sure that if people get sick or have to take care of an immediate family member that is sick, that person can do so without losing their job, right? So basically like labor laws, employment rights, those kind of what we describe benefits here, but really is sort of at the core of us taking care of each other, but then being able to come back to our job. So I think being vocal about that is very important that, you know, if we can advocate for that at a policy level. Also looking at like, you know, what are the main drivers of ill health and just, you know, encouraging each other to to be aware about that. That's everything from, you know, if you're a mom and you have time and you advocate for, you know, no vending machines in school because 30 times, 30 years down, down the road, you know, the people with more vending, unhealthier vending machines are going to be the ones suffering from obesity and diabetes and excessive costs of insulin. Like we know all that, right? So what are the small things in which we can actually, ways that we can advocate for these small changes that then over time impact, you know, accumulate in their impact. So we then avert that spending in the long run. You know, my mind always jumps to like, what are the policy changes? Like what saves us the most money, mm-hmm. right? And And what saves us the most money is really like access to, you know, it's five drivers, like making sure we can, you know, our kids can exercise, making sure that we have places where people can exercise for free, that it's encouraged. Smoking, vaping, making sure that that is really reduced, making sure that people can access their primary care provider at reasonable rates and that our medical system is incentivized to not, you know, more often a patient with a chronic disease is seen, the more billing can happen, but we actually don't reward physicians or healthcare workers that keep people healthy, right? What about that? What if we promoted that and made them examples and heroes of our society or the heroes of the medical system? So ultra-processed foods, really thinking about how can we make sure that we have dialogues and we hold corporations accountable that we deserve better foods and and policies that allow us to eat less processed food, less salt content, less high fructose corn syrup that's added above and beyond what we need on a daily basis, if any. Also like air quality, indoor and outdoor air quality is, is highly important. And then just the basic conditions around mental health. Like mental health, I'm shaking my head right now. I mean, it's 30 to 40% of our healthcare costs are related, both direct and indirect, are related to mental health conditions, right? We all have like between depression, I think of one quarter or more of women in the United States, adult women, are on some sort of form of antidepressant or or anti-anxiety medication, right? And that's a huge cost, right? I mean, that's a massive cost. I mean, in terms of the financially, time, productivity, everyone in their immediate environment. And like, how can we create these places of empathy, empathy, these healthier ways of the day-to-day. And again, that's a frugal decision, right? Making sure that people can get enough sleep, that they're not overly stressed, they're not overly anxious, actually will reduce premature mortality, will increase labor force participation. It will do so many good things for us, also financially, that on all these fronts, we can actually encourage the health, but also the well-being of our individual pocketbooks as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Room on both the micro and macro yeah. level to advocate for changes. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing is like investing in the cost to take care of yourself now won't solve the problem, but it'll save money on the larger problem and taking the time to invest in when it's time to advocate by your vote, taking the time to make sure that you are learning about the labor laws and and stuff like that and advocating for, even if you don't have a chronic illness, for advocating for those around you who do. Yeah. Just assuming that everybody does have someone around them with it. And just as a footnote, um, like, I mean, I know that like, one of my insurances, like, I mean, they kind of reimburse you if you check in on healthy behaviors and things like that. And, you know, sometimes that can be, again, that won't enrich one to like by thousands of dollars, but it can be at least ways that you feel like at least somewhat financially rewarded. Um, so if anyone, you know, is part of these types of programs, sometimes you can actually 
you know, or if you're quitting, there's like smoking cessation programs and they pay you $300 at the end if you actually quit mm. smoking. And But you pay with your diligence for that, for unlocking that that money. Mm-hmm. I have one more of a curveball question for but you. you <laughs> Jill's loving these today. I know, I am, because I feel like you can handle them. Of course you can handle them, <laughs> Dr. Andrea Feigl. So for somebody listening who maybe even going back to the beginning of this episode might be really resonating with the, because of this chronic illness that I'm managing, the advice that's given financially just can't totally work for me. I've got to do a lot of individualizing here, or maybe the person who's feeling a little bit deflated in managing their personal finances while managing their money. Is there anything, this isn't tips necessarily, just do you have any encouragement for them, for the person feeling Mm -hmm. deflated because of their chronic illness or as they care for someone with a chronic illness, feeling as though the typical advice doesn't work for me? What, What might you say to them? Yeah, I think that's such an important question. And again, you know, this is just an attempt and what's worked for me as well, right? I mean, it can be so daunting, both from like, you know, if you're stuck with, you know, large bills or like just a long journey ahead of you or like a forever journey, right? And I think that people are, I think we need to learn to to rejoice in small steps and also think about what am I, so A, the things that I do on my sort of personal health journeys is what are the small things I can change and Am I doing better today than I did yesterday, right? Did I, whatever, did I go to sleep a bit earlier? Did I manage my my stress a little bit more? That kind of stuff, because that accumulates over time. So chronic conditions come into play. Obviously, there's genetic predispositions, but very often they emerge from very long-term standing patterns. And so managing them will take time. Getting better will take time. And also getting better financially will take time as well. And again, I'm not trying to minimize the very acute, obviously physical pain, physical stress, and often a financial pain and stress. However, you know, I look at it also, so it's basically, are, am I better today? Am I making small things, small changes that in the end will get me there? And this is also like when you're, for example, on a fitness journey or a weight loss journey, for example, when will I be fit, right? I don't know when I will be fit, but I know that if I keep sticking to this plan, there will be a day in the future where I'm like, I guess I did it. But I need to keep going on that journey, right? Because it's not like, you're not going to be all all of a sudden um, in better financial shape, like overnight. You're not going to be like all of a sudden completely cured overnight unless some, some sort of miracle happens. But for most of us, it's a journey. And I think that kind of like looking at the what's better today than yesterday and realizing that I need to let go of that immediate need for feeling immediately better. But I just, if I stick to the plan, there will be one day where I look back, I'm like, yes, I'm better than I was. Like, I feel better financially. I feel better physically than I was three months ago or four months ago. Mm. You did it. Thanks for that message of gentleness. (laughs) That is definitely above and beyond what I was hoping for. Thank you for speaking (laughs) in the way that you did out of your expertise and years of experience and caring for others in this space. Speaking of consistency and just one day at a time, we don't know where it's going to lead, but we're going to keep doing it. And and I think you're fully capable of this one. (laughs) The The Bill of the Week! That's right! It's time for the best minute of your entire week! Maybe a baby was born and his name is William. Maybe you paid off your mortgage. Maybe your car died and you're happy to not have to pay that bill anymore. Duck bills, buffalo bills, Bill Clinton. This is the Bill of the Week. (laughs) I have so many of those. (laughs) I have way too many of those. (laughs) All right. I'm so excited. Yes. So, Dr. Andrea, every week we invite our guests or our listeners to share with us their bill for the week. And we are excited to hear yours. 
Yeah, so I got into a little car accident last weekend. Um, somebody bumped me. Thankfully, none of us were injured. So knock on wood. And thankfully, um, I have good insurance. But basically, I chose a rental car. And even though the insurance covers it, I was like, you know, I don't like, I think there's value in not overspending, right? Being frugal and mindful of resources, period. So I chose like a very cheap rental car. And then they came and brought me this massive SUV. And I thought, usually they honor the original price, right? And so I was really upset that they then like basically snuck me or my actually my insurance company with a bigger price tag. And I was like, that's so not cool. Like, even if I'm not paying for it, I don't think that, you know, they're basically abusing the system. And I just hate that. I hate the notion of, well, somebody else is paying for it. I can just stick them with the bill because I think it comes back to you. And I think it's a part of honesty and integrity. So I took it upon myself to be on hold for over three hours with this rental car company. And they, they never picked up. And then they like, um, and then I was like going on literally like Reddits and like e online searches because I'm like, I am not having them bill whoever they're billing more than they should. And I found this like corporate email address and I basically forwarded a complaint and CC'd my insurance and I said, this is the contract that's enough for, but this is the bill you stuck with me, with me with, and that's not okay. And then they escalated it and they're fixing the issue. So even though I'm not personally benefiting from it, I feel I did the right thing. But I just hated when like, you know, like I just hated when there is this overbilling issue and, and things like that. And I take, you know, I, on my company, I like, even though I don't have to, I check our bank account every single day. And I just, also, like, um, sorry, one more bill, like two years ago, around Thanksgiving, somebody, it's always around Thanksgiving because that's when the, the taxes are due for nonprofits. And then basically we always have to say how much is in the bank account. So basically, like, I hope no scammer is listening to this, but basically, like, nonprofits have to basically report how much money is in their bank each year, which companies or for-profits don't have to do that. And so around the busy shopping time is when people try to take advantage of organizations like ours that tries to do good work and it's very hard to raise money for nonprofits. And so they started racking up a credit card and I was able to reverse that. And then two, last year, they tried to steal $60,000 from our bank account by breaking into our Expensify and changing the spending limit on our cards. And again, I was thankfully able to stop that and reverse that. But, you know, $60,000 for a nonprofit that tries to help people with chronic conditions. I mean, how crazy and annoying do you have to be to try and stiff us with that you know so annoying is not the word <laughs> i would have to crazy be and annoying that's here. their kind that's not <laughs> yeah, other I words <laughs> and then expensive i said this is a little spending card that was created by these scammers and it says like easy money and i'm like you gotta be kidding me so yeah i go i go full <laughs> in like if i feel that there's an unjust bill there's an overbilling there's something i go and i'm like not with me. I'm very, I, I'm like, no, not with me. So I love this question, by the way. Oh my God. <laughs>
Simple Truth, exclusively at Baker's. It's never too late. Never too late to earn a degree. Never too late for a comeback. Between your busy career and taking care of a family, it can feel like there's never a good time to go back to school. But your time is now. Time to start your comeback with Purdue Global. As Purdue's online university for working adults, Purdue Global is dedicated to supporting adults like you who know it's time to earn the recognition you deserve. You have the experience. You have the knowledge. It's time to get credit for the work you've done. You can balance work, family, and everything in between while earning your degree. It's time to move forward in your career, for your family and for yourself, with a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will recognize and respect. You're worth this investment in yourself to earn a degree you deserve. It's never too late. Never too late to go back to school and come back stronger with an education you can trust. Now is the time for your comeback. Start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. And now it's time for the lightning <laughs> round. All right. Now we it's get more time animated the, as the episode goes on. I know. On. We do our own stunts. So <laughs> this week's question in the vulnerability round is, how do you personally budget and or save for like regular non-emergency medical expenses? That regular self-care that's going to cost us a little bit in the short term, but save us in the long run. So, Andrea, you can go first. Shout out to good old Excel. Um, I just have like an Excel sheet and try to have like Slack in and what I'm doing. And I do overspend in healthy foods and personal trainers. Hey, it's not overspending if that's what you value. <laughs> I value it a lot. <laughs> I also uh, recently got divorced and uh, my some of my friends called me uh, like, you know, you don't have a revenge dress. You have a revenge body. I gladly take that compliment. Amen. That <laughs> says, okay. seems yes. way more <laughs> sustainable and <laughs> there's a lot more longevity in that so. for sure. I love a revenge body. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I tried to budget and I was always very good with numbers and I even budgeted for my parents when I was young. I grew up very poor and I actually sometimes went grocery shopping for them because my mom would always spend something extra and I was like, no, 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 you got to stick to the budget. So I had to basically just intrinsically know like what's over and under spending. And then, you know, I tried to like get my stuff together of like making sure I have a couple of months worth of savings and stuff like that. So, but again, I I grew up very poor, but I'm now in a very privileged position that I thankfully I'm able to put some money aside and to have a little bit of slack. But yeah, I've been on $35 a week food budgets and literally like no savings wow. when I was in my university program. And I had these issues with my teeth and all of a sudden $7,000 in expenses. And I was working 65 hours a week while I was doing my master's program. So I know how it feels. And I'm just like, when you're stuck in this position, I I just honestly did what I could and prayed and leaned on some friends. So, you know. Mm. Yes. Sometimes that's how we get unexpected things covered. Mm -hmm. honestly. There's, those seasons exist in yeah. chronic illness and regular illness so yeah we don't want gofundme to mm -mm. be the plan yeah but sometimes it's what ends up being what's needed and so i'm glad that it does Absolutely. exist because we don't we don't always have backup mm. for whatever life throws at us so good to have friends Absolutely. and community jill is that your plan is that your <laughs> answer go <GoFundMe. laughs> <laughs> that's how you save for regular there was a really <laughs> fun um there was a really fun study that looked at like what makes people live long and it's basically the amount of friends you have the amount of exercise you do the amount of beans and lentils you eat so exercise sleep friends and beans things are looking good you know so here. exercise sleep <laughs> friends and beans <laughs> i am gonna live forever <laughs> i am gonna live forever because I, I the love beans lentils. one, I wouldn't vitamin have expected. B, vitamin B. I love beans. Quite interesting. <laughs> My children are going to live even longer because basically that's all Kai eats. Excellent. It's just beans. Excellent. So, and the younger I've one. I've been is making starting. a bean salad lately. I didn't even know I was investing in longevity. Oh We're going to live forever wow. together, Jill. Together. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> our old age. This okay, massive Jill, community is, we built. What is your actual answer? Oh, you, no one's going to like this. Well, who knows? I can't say that. You're saying non-emergency. I do have a sinking fund for medical expenses, and it's the amount of my deductible, which is quite high. So if I can't pay routine expenses out of just like my miscellaneous money, then I'll dip into that sinking fund. But as far as preventative care goes, I, I am not a person living with chronic illness. And so I'm as focused as much as possible on just how can I maintain health in my day to day and how can I do it for free? <laughs> so I'm really not spending on medical things. Uh, I do free YouTube exercise. I make a veggie smoothie every morning with my Vitamix. I invested in that three years ago on a Black Friday. I recommend it. Everybody knows she loves um, her Vitamix. I drink a lot of water. I love sleep. <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's what I do. <laughs> what about you, Jen? Um, so I am not getting a ton of sleep right now still, but as you know, Atlas is like, what, seven, eight, almost eight months old at this point. So it's getting better for sure. And I'm actually like in this right now. I didn't I didn't plan this around this episode, but I had a, a back injury two weeks ago. So I don't regularly have medical expenses, but I have been spending more than usual right now just because of this lower back illness injury. And I have a half marathon in a week and a half. So like there's like a time crunch to getting it. So I am spending a lot of money on chiropractic care and acupuncture uh, to try and heal it quickly. And two things I will recommend on those like community acupuncture, just Googling community acupuncture in your city is low cost sliding seal acupuncture. And then the joint chiropractors like I had never been but it's like essentially a franchise that just makes chiropractic care affordable and accessible. And, and I was like, yay, they're doing great work. So I think finding those community, they're not nonprofits. They are for-profit companies, but with a goal to make quality for-profit care accessible. And they just change up the way they do it. It's in a, it's not private room. It's not exclusive. Uh, it's, you know, one big room. So looking for things like that, when I do need care, but then it really just comes out of our miscellaneous fund because I don't use it very often. I work out very frequently. So I have been struggling with postpartum depression in this postpartum experience. I didn't with my last one. And so I have personally decided to try and just use exercising to get through it. And that has really worked well. And the biggest cost to that has been my personal guilt for choosing to exercise rather than like if I should be working or feeling like I should be working or maybe feeling guilty for having my kid in daycare. But knowing that this is that is the highest cost I pay for for this like type of self-care. So that is my medical expense is in a nutshell right now. Thanks for sharing. Very quick footnote to this. Um just because you, you you sparked my brain. Um, I don't, so back when I was in Canada and I don't know if they have this here. So for me, like chiropractor, like I used to be a dancer and again, like a student. So they used to have these colleges of massage therapy and you could basically get students to give you massages. And I put, I also hacked the system because they had eight semesters. So I started to know that I needed to ask for level seven, level eight students to get scheduled for my massages. So pretty much I got a almost fully baked massage therapist as opposed to like a novice. <laughs> um, and, you know, you got like massages for 20 or $25. That's also how I got my haircuts and like all this kind of stuff. Again, not medical, but whatever. So I don't know if that exists in the States, but that it, it might as well, you know. So, yes. so things like that. Um, just about exercise, you know, like exercise releases actually like um, happiness hormones, like from your muscles, when you compress your muscles. It, and I find it so fascinating, mm -hmm. but it's essentially therapy. And then the other thing I did, because again, like it's so like mental health care, even with the apps and whatnot can be so expensive. And like, that's not just for the US, it's internationally. So there's one program I loved um, and it's called 15minutesforme.com. 
And um, they just, I think it's like 50 bucks per month or something like that. But it has like this like daily check-ins and things like that. And when I was traveling a lot and really like, you know, just stressed and sleep deprived, I was like, I just need something. But I couldn't see my therapist and I couldn't afford to see my therapist. You know, I was like, totally like this is, again, it's not free, but it's comparatively affordable and also really like, you know, science-based and helpful. Yes. Mm, lovely. Uh, we actually Thanks for these did, additional tips at the end. I know. I love <laughs> and, and we actually did an episode about getting those like services from different schools. Episode 336. I just looked it up. But yes. So I haven't. There's a massage school actually very close to where we live that I have gotten a massage at before. But I haven't done one lately. Yeah. Thank you for those additional tips. Speaking of more, Dr. Andrea, where can people get more from you? I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So just my name, Andrea Feigl on LinkedIn, and you'll find me. Obviously, hopefully, you know, people who listen to this podcast. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so our website is healthfinanceinstitute.org. Or you can email me. It's Andrea at healthfinanceinstitute.org. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Andrea. Thank you for everything you've spoken. It's been enlightening and we've both just, our necks are tired from nodding so much. So thank you so much. <laughs> no, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for what you do. It's it's absolutely needed. And you guys are fantastic. You ladies are fantastic. So it's, what a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Sometimes you leave an interview saying like, that was a good one. And I, and I left thinking, that's a good one. I think people are going to get something out of it because I did at least. So if I can, you can. I'm not going to lie. There was a few moments where I felt on the verge of tears, and that may just be where I am today, <laughs> whatever I'm experiencing inside myself today. That's Tuesday but it feels. Just, I think the extra focus and acknowledgement of what those managing chronic illnesses are facing day in and day out can I just, as I look at it, can feel so weighty. And so I think even to hear Dr. Feigl's messaging of one day at a time, be gentle with yourself. Yeah, there there was just a lot in there that felt so intensive, but in a good way. And I'm so glad that we've got the space to look at what are the circumstances that many of our listeners are experiencing and our friends and family. I mean, you you know that I lived with my grandmother who has Alzheimer's for a year to take care of her and met those uh, indirect mm-hmm. costs of it interrupting some work and yeah, just the, the toll that it takes on life. And that was just a year. So Andrea, I appreciate this podcast and I, I don't know, I, I love our community and the people who even message us asking, hey, what about me? Can you help the community to see people like me who's managing mental health concerns, chronic physical ailments. Can we make sure that all of us are seen and acknowledged? So lots of feels going on for me over here and grateful for experts like Dr. Andrea and and grateful for all of you who are listening. Many of you know that we also have a newsletter. It's called The Friend Letter, and we send it out three times a week where we talk about freebies and savings tips and life hacks. And actually, so many were mentioned by Dr. Andrea this week. I think this week we're talking about Uh, beauty schools and how to save in that regard and just lots of different savings tips and hacks that are in this newsletter. So if you want those reminders, you want to know what's available, you want something in your inbox weekly that's helping you to save and get free things, please get get that. We want to also shout out a friend for replying to one of our emails who said, I love this and how finances relate to our hierarchy of needs filing this away to glance back at forever. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Not just in the future, but a glance back for forever from Rachel. And that's been a special unexpected treat too, is seeing the response emails. Because you can, you can get the newsletter, the friend letter, and then respond to us and we see it. And so that's also amazing. It comes straight to our inbox. There's no like public forum for these emails, but We love to read them, and it is special for us. So thank you for your email, Rachel. 
So if you want these freebies, savings tips, values-based spending hacks to your inbox every week so that you can even earmark them for forever, frugalfriendspodcast.com slash friend letter, or you could just go to our website, frugalfriendspodcast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram because we love it when you can engage with us there. And the link is in our bio. So tons of ways to get at us. See you next time. Frugal Friends is produced by Eric Siriani. So I was at FinCon this past week. Mm-hmm. For those of a you more. who don't know, FinCon is a financial media convention and expo. It is where all of your favorite money podcasters, bloggers, YouTubers, uh, and a lot of influencers converge on each other for a week, converge on a city for a week. Sorry, that was a bad way to say that. Uh, And this year was New Orleans. And I'd never been to New Orleans. And this might be a little TMI, but I had a checklist of things that I wanted to eat in New Orleans. And mm. I made the whole checklist. I did all of them. No And way. by the end of the week, I had consumed so much sodium that my feet swelled like I was nine months pregnant. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was so painful. I don't eat a lot of sodium, like, even in the takeout I get. Like, I'm, I don't know if my body just wasn't accustomed to it or what. Um, but I was told after I told somebody like how much, not how much I'd eaten, but like what I'd eaten, they're like, oh yes, all of those things have, um, a lot of salt. And I was like, oh, can you give us like a quick snapshot of what, what, yes. what's good um, there? I started with beignets, but I don't think those were the salty, you know, the things with the salt. Um, I had jambalaya, gumbo, mm, mm-hmm. shrimp mm. po' boys. Mm. Um, many Sazeracs, which is mm. a, a local delicacy drink. Um, also don't think those were the salt givers, but, um, I had the other things multiple times and, uh, while all delicious, probably too, contributed too to the demise of my ankles. Too much of a good thing. Yeah, my Isn't ankles left me thing. and I just had a leg, <laughs> just had leg all the way down. So. Well, what did you learn, Jen? Uh, uh, everything in moderation. <laughs> yes. FinCon's dangerous. FinCon is dangerous. That's what I learned. <laughs> I'll be back next year in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> with moderation in tow. Maybe. Simple Truth Brand makes it easy to find better for you products that are free from unwanted ingredients. From fresh produce and snacks to household cleaners and more, you won't find artificial ingredients, preservatives, or harsh chemicals in Simple Truth products. So you can fill your fridge and your home with simple, easy to understand choices you can feel good about. Just look for the green Simple Truth Circle to get the quality items you want free from the ingredients you don't want. Simple Truth, exclusively at Baker's. With the best all-inclusive vacation deals to Mexico and the Caribbean, booking your getaway with cheap Caribbean vacations means you have more freedom to do your deal. Whether you want to enjoy snorkeling, endless margaritas and more, or simply soak up the sun and sand in a tropical paradise, cheap Caribbean vacations has your deal for that. Plan and book the exact getaway you want at exactly the right price for you by using our exclusive budget beach finder. Or find a featured all-inclusive package to Iberostar Hotels and Resorts and do your deal at CheapCaribbean.com.